Howdy everyone, I'm Michael Perch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin and I record all my lectures to share with my students evergreen content and to support working professionals. Anyone interested to learn about data analytics, geostatistics, or machine learning. So, my students asked me to produce a Data Science Basics and Python series specifically to help them with the nuts and bolts of getting the job done, building their workflows. Check out the other lectures and live code demonstrations with available code for you to follow along, where I cover topics like working with tabular and gridded data, and also being able to build machine learning workflows with pipelines and so forth. Okay, so let's carry on. We're gonna. We're gonna step back a little bit now and just talk about basic univariate statistical analysis in Python. So this is a demonstration of the calculation with a minor degree of visualization for basic statistical analysis. This is a part of what we'll do when we're working with uh, feature engineering and the data analytics to get ready to build our predictive and also inferential models. We're gonna work with just univariate statistics here very simple we'll use the python packages or resources statistics is a module within the python standard library you'll just have that available ready to go scipy is a wonderful python package for mathematics science and engineering and matplotlib always use it for visualization i find it very powerful very flexible we'll cover a variety of common basic statistical analysis and displays Okay, just really quickly, one at a time, we'll go through a bunch of different things. This tutorial is going to include the methods and operations you would need as part of a larger workflow for data checking and cleaning, data mining, inferential data analytics, predictive modeling, and so forth, all as part of a overall method in or workflow in data analytics, geostats, and machine learning. I cover the types of functions you would need as a scientist and engineer working in you know a wide variety of different fields i want to give you a couple of general definitions just to get started remember statistics is collecting organizing interpreting data as well as drawing conclusions all to support decision making i tell my students if you don't impact the decision you're not adding value now we know that geostats is a branch of applied statistics that integrates the spatial and for, if you're in the subsurface, often a geologic context. Of course, we can work above surface too. Spatial relationships, volumetric support and scale, i.e. the size or volume support of the data, the model, the predictions and so forth. And also ubiquitous uncertainty. We can't avoid that uncertainty. That's what geostats is all about. Data analytics, the use of statistics with a lot of emphasis on visualization to support decision making. I would suggest there's really no difference between data analytics and statistics. There's a little bit of rebranding, update your CV. And big data analytics, if you work with large, you know the Vs, variety, veracity, you know, volume, you know, those criteria for big data. If you work with data that's difficult to work with like that, then you can say you're doing big data analytics. Variable or feature, any property measured, observed in a study. If you're working in the subsurface with rock and pore systems, then porosity, permeability, if you're working in mining, mineral concentrations or other fields, uh, saturations, contaminant concentration, if you're working in environmental or something like that. So um, these measures specifically in the subsurface often require a significant amount of analysis, interpretation, and have uncertainty. That's what we call in subsurface modeling data softness. Hard data, no uncertainty. Population, if you had superhuman power and you could see the entire volume of interest of the subsurface and you could observe at every location at a scale needed to answer your scientific engineering question, the property of interest, then you would have the population. Okay, that's not generally accessible to us. That's the exhaustive set of values over the entire subsurface volume. Instead, we have a limited sample, a set of values that have been measured at specific locations. Okay, 
population and sample, very basics. Parameter is a summary measure of the population. Every time we talk about one of our measures, we should talk about a population mean, population standard deviation. This is something that we rarely have access to, and I don't want people to mix up parameters here with model parameters, which are different and are covered when we talk about predictive machine learning. The statistic is a summary measure of the sample. Remember the limited set of measures that you have from the exhaustive population. We use the term sample mean, sample standard deviation, and when we use statistics, we're often working in an inferential workflow. We're making assumptions about what they tell us about the inaccessible population parameters. All right. We're going to cover a wide variety of different statistics right now. We're going to cover measures of central tendency, which include average or arithmetic average or mean, the median, the mode, the geometric, harmonic, and power law averages. We're going to also cover measures of dispersion or spread within the data distribution, variance, standard deviation, range, percentile, and interquartile range. We'll cover the outliers, methods to check for outliers, just the two key outlier tests, something very simple. And then we'll talk about distribution shape and we'll look at skew, kurtosis, Pearson's, mode skewness, quartile skew coefficient. Now, this lecture is not about the theory or the details. I show the equations, but that's going to be it. If you want much more information about this, go ahead and check out the associated lecture on YouTube. We'll also show cumulative distribution functions, including a non-parametric CDF and how we plot it directly from the data. We'll do it by hand and we'll fit the CDF from the data using a parametric distribution. We're not going to get into details about parametric distributions, but we'll just show that. Very simple stuff. If you want to follow along, you want to actually do this along with me, super cool, you can do that. The code is available to you. Everything's available to you. Just install Anaconda on your machine. You can go here to get it. Go ahead and open a Jupyter Notebook. Once you've done that, you can load the workflow that I'm going to work through. It is available here on my GitHub account at this link right here. It's in my Python numerical demos repository. There's a long list of well-documented workflows in data analytics, geostats, and machine learning there for you. You go ahead and you load the data. Now the data you'll see we can load directly from my GitHub account. I have a repository with geo data sets, a whole bunch of them that people can use for testing and trying things out. If you want to work locally, you don't want to be connected to the internet. When you do this, you can of course copy the data file locally and do everything locally. That's fine too. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. This is a live code demonstration in a Jupyter Notebook using slides. So let's go ahead and we'll run through the code together. I hope you're ready to go. We're going to start out by importing all of our packages. As I mentioned before, matplotlib, we're going to use pyplot module as PLT. This is very common. SciPy, as I mentioned before, for all our mathematics and statistics. And we have stats statistics available to us as a standard library module to work with. And we also, from SciPy, we want specifically get this norm functionality for being able to work with Gaussian distributions when we do the parametric distribution fit. Let's go ahead and run that code. I'm going to run it. You're going to see there's a star there and now one. It's run successfully. Do you feel the world's brilliance now on your desktop? You're ready to go. Now what I like to do all the time is I like to set the working directory. I don't know about you, but I often lose files. If I run a workflow and I don't explicitly say put the files here or load the files from here, I, I often run into trouble. In addition, I find that I often have complicated workflows where I'm going to like load and save files from multiple locations. So I like to change the working directory as I'm working to do that. So go ahead. We use the OS, which is the operating system functionality allows us to change the directory. We can also run code in a command window. There's so many cool things you can do with that. Let's go ahead and run that code. And now we've set the working directory. 
Now it's okay, we're gonna load the data from the cloud. If you were to go ahead and load the data locally, make sure that working directory is where you save the file. Let's go ahead and load a data set. 2D MV 200 Wells is a subsurface data set from my GitHub account. It includes the following features. X and Y, we're not gonna to use today. Porosity, we're gonna use. It's a measure of the fraction or rock void fraction. Permeability, we're not gonna to use today, but you can decide to use it later. Millidarcy's and acoustic impedance shown right here. All of these are useful measures you can use for these univariate analyses. Now, the first thing we'll do is we'll use pandas data frames. PD is our pandas. We're gonna load up, read the common delimited file directly from my GitHub account. Geostats guy is my account and geo data sets is the repository. We're gonna load it in and make it into a data frame. This code right here is just gonna rename some of the feature names. The column names are a little bit, uh, they're a little verbose, they'll be bad for code readability. So let's go ahead and run this code and then we'll preview and see what we have. We've just loaded an X, Y, faces, porosity. Oh, I forgot to mention, I have faces, which are ones and twos. Twos are sandstone and the ones are kind of more shaly. We're just gonna mix all the faces together in this analysis. And we also have porosity, permeability, and acoustic impedance, as I mentioned up here. Okay, I'll make sure I add in the faces up there. Now we're gonna extract a single feature to work with. The whole point is that we're doing univariate analysis, univariate statistics, so we don't really need a bunch of features to work with. We're gonna use this functionality right here. We can take the data frame, pick a specific feature column, and extract the values. When you do this, this will extract a one-dimensional ND array, which we can look, work with. Now. Right now I have it set to porosity. I have it extracting the porosity feature from the previous table. I gave the units, the units for when we squared in dispersion, measure of dispersion like variance, we squared units, the min and max values. You can come back here and change this to anything and you can work with any of the other features if you wanna repeat this. Let's go ahead and run that. So we are working with porosity fraction from column porosity. Okay, so we're good to go. Our X is gonna be a 1D array of the porosity values. Now what we're gonna do is just to kind of understand what our data looks like, let's just do a fast histogram plot, the most basic display of a data distribution. Let's go ahead and run that code. From matplotlib, we have the hiss command, just all you have to do is give the one dimensional array. I like to set the color of the bars and I like to explicitly set the number of bars. Of course, you can rerun this, change the number of bars, and you'll get more detail. Of course, the challenge with histogram is too many bars, it's too noisy. Too few bars, it's too smooth. You don't see the detail. You can decide on a good number of bars. Okay, so we can see we have a slight negative skew on the distribution. We monomodal. A little bit of noise here, but it looks pretty well behaved. That's interesting. Okay, that's what we're working with now. Let's go ahead. And we'll start with our statistics, our measures of central tendency. How do we calculate an arithmetic average or a mean with the data? Well, the formula for the mean is shown right here. Very, very simple. You sum all the values and you divide by the number of values. The arithmetic average or mean can be calculated just using NumPy. And you can put average. And what it'll do is it'll take an ND array and calculate the average. Now you can work with multi-dimensional arrays and get the averages of all the columns or all the rows. I like to do that all the time. So let's go ahead and run that code. The average is 14.9. Now if we look back here, you can look and see the average right here. That's looking pretty good, it looks reasonable. Okay, let's look at the weighted average. Now I'm not gonna show weighting on all of the statistics, but I wanna just indicate that many of the methods I show can be weighted. If you're doing declustering and you're getting weights on your data, you can go ahead and set the weights. How do you do it? NumPy average like we did before, and we go ahead and we specify weights equal to weights. In this case, I just used a ND array of the same length as the original array with all ones. Weight of one, it'll be equal to the naive average it's not going to be changed at all but you could change that you could use weights from declustering let's go ahead and we run that we got the same result it worked we can check yep it's the same result i went back now I go forward so we're doing well um, but if you want to do any type of declustering you're good to go you can do weighting on many different statistics let's do the median the median is pretty straightforward it is the p50 
It's the 50th percentile. We show the notation is the P50 of X. And the way we calculate it is the inverse of the cumulative distribution function of the data for a P value of 0.5 and or cumulative probability value of 0.5. So just go to the CDF plot, go to 0.5, go across to the CDF, come down. That's what we're doing. Another way to think about it is we sort the data in ascending order and we find the value in the middle. That's the P50. Let's go ahead. We can use NumPy again and we got the median command and we run that and voila, we have our median value. Now, the distribution is just slightly skewed. It's not surprising that the mean and the median are not that dissimilar from each other. Okay. Now, the mode. The mode is the most common value. To do this, you really need to bin the values because I hope you can understand if I calculate a mode, but all of the values are reported to the 10th decimal place, there's no most common value. So in order to do this calculation, what we need to do is we need to bin the data. The way we're going to do that is we're going to round the data to two decimal places. So now all of our data is going to be basically binned as 0 0.01, 0 0.02, point, all the way up to 0 0.30. And then we'll find the bin with the most amount of data. It's equivalent to imagining a, a, a histogram with that many bins, 30 bins or 29 bins, and finding the bin with the most number of samples in the bin. And we do that and we get 0.14 is the mode value. Okay, good. All right, so we have calculated our mode value. Now, geometric mean. The geometric mean is getting more complicated. It's a very useful mean. I like to use it as a measure of central tendency for log normal distributions. And we can also use it for effective uh, permeability in the case of flow going oblique to bedding. So, geometric mean can be calculated by using from SciPy stats. We have a G mean available in the MSTATS module. So we go ahead and we run that. We'll get the geometric mean and we got 0.145. Now I'm reporting everything to the third decimal place just to kind of, I'm, I'm not thinking about significance. I'm just trying to give you a sense that there is some change. I don't want to show too few decimals and you think everything's the same. Now the harmonic mean is different. Harmonic mean is a good measure of the effective permeability for the case of flow going perpendicular to geologic bedding. So it's really useful to us. We can go to the same module, SciPy stats, M stats, and we have H mean. And we can go ahead and calculate that. And when we do that, we get 0 0.140. Okay, that's good. So we calculate the harmonic mean. Now we can get a little bit more complicated, and that is we can do a power law average. The power law average is the case of the general form. We know that the harmonic mean is the case of a power negative one. And we know that the arithmetic mean is the case of a power equals to one, P equals to one. And the geometric mean you can show by limits is the case of P equals to zero, which is really cool. It's a, there's a really good derivation for that. So this is the general power law averaging relationship. How do we do it? We can go ahead and take the average of the values raised to a power and then we go ahead and we take the inverse of that power of the final sum of the final average right there, just as shown in the equation right there. And we can set this power as anything. Let's go ahead and run that. Okay, so for a power of negative 0.5, we get but 1, 4, 3. We can try negative 1. And we got exactly the same thing as we did for the harmonic mean, which is really cool. That's what it should be. If we go ahead and we do a case of one, we should get the same result of the arithmetic mean. Okay, so this is really cool. We can do the power law averaging. Um, people use power law averaging when they do some type of physics-based experiment to calibrate the power. I've seen that's pretty cool stuff too. Okay, let's go ahead and leave that power law averaging. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the original histogram of our porosity values. I'm going to take a variety of di different measures we just calculated, label them, and plot them. And now we can look at our original distribution, and we have the average, we have the median value shown right there, we have the mode value shown over here, we have the power value shown right here. 
Now, one thing I should clarify is if you look, you'll notice that the maximum number of bins, the bin with the maximum number of data doesn't line up with our mode. We can probably correct that by fixing the number of bins and voila, you see what happened? I said it was about 29 bins because we were going from 0 0.00, 0 0.01, all the way to 0.3. And so that's 29 bins. If I set my, my plot of 29 bins, you can see the mode now lines up with the bin with the most amount of data. See, so it works, so the mode worked. Okay, this is super cool. So these are all of our measures of central tendency. Now let's talk about measures of dispersion because we need to understand the spread in the data. One of our favorites is the population variance. Population variance is just the average of, oh boy, did I just do that? I just, I missed a square term there. I'm sorry. Okay, the population variance is shown right here. Next, we have the sample variance. If you look really carefully at the equation, you'll see the only difference is the degrees of freedom. I'm not gonna get into that. I'm not gonna talk about number of assumptions and assuming the mean or anything like that. But this right here is the sample variance, the sum of the squares of the values minus their sample mean, and we divide by the number of data minus one. And we go ahead and calculate that right there. Now I'm reporting it in fraction squared because technically anytime you have a variance measure it's actually in the units of the square of the original feature and we we're talking about the fraction of void space. The population standard deviation is shown right here. I like standard deviation because it's in the units of the original feature the equation right here, if you look really carefully, is just the square root of the population variance. And the way we calculate it is using the stats module where we, we go back to stats, statistics. Next, we have the population standard deviation. If you look carefully, you'll see that it's just the square root of the pop of the population variance. And I like working with standard deviation because it's in the units of the original feature. Also for under certain distribution assumptions, I can immediately think about how does that relate to confidence intervals and so forth. So I often use standard deviation. The st population standard deviation can be calculated going back to statistics and using the PSTDEV command with our 1D array, and that goes ahead and calculates it for us. That's the population standard deviation right there. The sample standard deviation, once again, just like we saw before, in the case of the sample, we just do N minus one right here, and we take the square root of the sample variance to get the sample standard deviation, and we can go back to stats again and use the STDEV command to get the sample standard deviation. And we'll go ahead and run that. And there's the result right there. So pretty straightforward to calculate these measures. If you want to work with the range, the range is actually really straightforward. It's just the P100 minus the P00. In other words, the maximum value minus the minimum value. Now, a lot of people don't like the range because it's too... Uh, sensitive to outliers, of course, but the range can be calculated simply by taking the maximum value. NumPy has functionality to give that to you, minus the minimum value, and you get the range right here. We go from, we have a 0.173 change in porosity values over our data set. The percentile built into NumPy, we have a percentile command and allows us to calculate any percentile for any possible cumulative probability or p-value. So 13, that's 13% 13 or really more, that's 0 0.0, that's 0 0.13. We can go ahead and calculate that percentile right there. And if you want to change it and try something out, well, you can say, okay, what is the 99th percentile? And you see it's 0 0.216. And what's the... 0, 01 percentile or 1 percentile, and you'll see it's 0 0.067. So that's how we calculate percentiles.
Now, you might ask me, well, wait a minute, Michael. You said you were talking about measures of dispersion. Why did I talk about percentiles? Because what's coming up next, interquartile range, is the P75 minus the P25. It's a better measure of dispersion than the range because the fact that you're working with the upper and lower quartile, 75 minus P25, that makes you less sensitive to outlier values. So it's a pretty good measure, actually. So let's go ahead, and what we'll do is within SciPy stats module, we have a function, IQR, interquartile range. It does it all at once. We could have used the NumPy functionality with percentiles to do this too. P75 minus P25, and go. That's it. So you can see the interquartile range is quite a bit less than the actual data range. The two key tests for outliers, there are packages and methods that will do it all and can it up for you. If you want to do it by hand, this is what I'm showing you. You can do that. You can use the percentile command. You can pass your ND array with all the data. You can give a list of values for the percentiles you want, the P25 and the P75, and you can get multiple outputs. So boom, one line, you got both of them. You can go ahead and calculate the interquartile range. We already did that, so we'll use it again, times 1.5. And now we can calculate the lower and upper fence. We can now use ND arrays with NumPy's where command to be able to identify data that exceed the fence, that are greater than the upper fence or less than the lower fence. And we'll go ahead and we'll get those back. Now what we can do is we can go ahead and we can indicate what are the outliers from the array. Now, the where command actually gave us the indices where this occurred. And so all we have to do is go back and run the where command again. But this time, we're not going to put it in the array and get the actual values. That will give us the indices if you want to work with the outlier values. You want to retrieve them, find out where they are in your data set. So we run that code, and we get the porosity outliers by the two key test include these values right here, and their indices, data indices, from 0 to n minus 1 data indices in the data set, 110, 152, 198. Those are our outlier values. Okay, so we can do this very easily, find our outlier values. Now, if you want to, you could visualize the outliers and many of the things we just looked at, kind of a sense of spread like interquartile range and the median value and all of that at once by using what's known as a box plot or box and whisker plots. Uh, so we run that and here's our box plot right here. We got our lower quartile, the P25, the P75 shown right there. We got the median value, the P50 right there. These are the values in porosity. We've got the upper fence, the lower fence, and these are our three outliers on the lower tail. Isn't that super cool? So we can look at it all at once and see what's happening graphically with the distribution. Now, sometimes we want to understand and quantify the shape of the distribution, not just the central tendency and the dispersion. So we'll want to work with measures of skew and kurtosis. Skew, kind of, I think intuitively we know it's going to be if there's asymmetry in the distribution. There's a variety of methods. One of them, a simple one, is the Pearson's mode skewness. The equation is shown right here. It's just simply three times the difference between the sample mean and the P50 value standardized by the standard deviation. Now, it's, it's pretty intuitive. We can imagine that if there's no skew, we would expect the mean and the P50 to be the same. And so you can see that the skew, Pearson's mode skewness, is going to be zero for the case of you have a distribution with no skew at all. The way we calculate it, I'll do it right here. Oh, I forgot. There's a three times right there. And we go ahead and we can calculate it right here. Now, remember, we said there's a negative skew on this distribution. And you can see right here that the result is a negative value in the skew. You could see it from the histogram, of course. There was a tail going towards the smaller values. If you want to calculate the population skew, in other words, the third central moment, you can do that. And I, I love these moments. It's really cool because if you think about it, this is doing a third power of the difference between the values and the population mean shown right here. And 
we're doing a summation of that and then we're taking like an average. So it's an average cubed difference between the values and the mean. Now, when we do a cube power, we preserve the negative and positive aspects. And so if you have more extreme values on the negative side, they will win and the resulting sum will be negative. You see that? So it's really kind of cool to think about it that way. The SciPy stats module has the moments function, which allows you to do any moment. So we'll go ahead and do the third central moment right here. And we calculate it and we get a slightly a, a negative value here as we would expect. All right. We can do the quartile skew coefficient, which I think is really cool. Uh, very intuitive, in fact, because it's just a measure of the difference between the delta or change from the P50 to the P75 minus the P50 to the P25. So you see which one is kind of further out. And the whole thing is standardized by the interquartile range. So it's a very simple calculation. I did it by hand down here. I'm sure you can find a package to do this all at once. And we run it and we get the porosity quartile skew coefficient shown right here. Now you might wonder why this is not negative like our other measures of skew. My hypothesis would be that when we look at the tail that we observed within the distribution, that tail was probably more in the very low values outside of the interquartile range. And that won't really, this won't be as sensitive to those values. So I think that's what's happening here is we're losing that sensitivity to those kind of tail values. Okay, now how do we plot a non-parametric CDF? Let's just finish up with this. If you go to my lectures on CDFs and histograms and PDFs, you'll see that it's very straightforward. We just sort the data. So we can use NumPy sort command to sort the data. Then what you do is you're gonna to have to calculate the cumulative probabilities for each one of the values. This right here, if you look at it really carefully, this makes an array of values going from zero to n minus one. And this right here is saying n minus one right here. So what we have here is simply an index, which is i minus one, n minus one, cumulative probability assumption right here. And if you look at it, you can work it out pretty, it's pretty straightforward. The reason this is i minus one is this actually naturally goes from zero to n minus one. Then we go ahead and we just scatter plot those with each other, the cumulative probability values on the y, the sorted values on the x, and we plot that and we get a wonderful looking cumulative distribution function shown right here. Wow, you know, it's, it's very interesting. You can see right here, the P25, the P30, the P40, the P50. I love CDFs. They're very nice to look at and visualize. You can see this tail on the negative side. You remember what we said about the interquartile, the, the calculation of skew based on the interquartile um, behavior. And if you look at this, so much we can learn and read and understand from CDFs. Now I wanna show one more thing and then I promise I'll be done. Let's fit a Gaussian distribution to our data. Now it's a little bit asymmetric. It's, it's I've got a bit of skew, so it's not purely Gaussian, but we'll do our best. We're gonna get a little bit fancy here. We're gonna use the maximum likelihood estimation approach for the Gaussian distribution. We have functionality built into that. First thing we're gonna do, we're gonna make an array of values going from minimum to maximum 100 values. We're just trying to be able to visualize our function. Then we're gonna use the norm that we imported that spe specifically from SciPy, so we can fit it. This will fit with a maximum likelihood estimation approach to get the best values for the mean and standard deviation. Then what we can do is we'll use the norm CDF command to and all of these values to calculate the cumulative probability values for our fit, and we can go ahead and plot that. And we have our nice fit Gaussian distribution shown right there. Okay, pretty straightforward. We've just done a bunch of things with univariate statistics in Python. This was very basic. I hope this was helpful to you. There's a lot more videos and lectures that I have available. I hope those are helpful to you too. And want to work together? If you're interested to work together, I do a lot with my consortium, with teaching inside of companies. I work on all kinds of projects with my students to partner and collaborate with industry or a variety of different companies. So I'm always happy to discuss. 
I'm Michael Perch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin, and I record all my lectures to share evergreen content with my students, but also to support working professionals. I hope this was helpful to you. Stay safe.